for our next speaker, we have Amy, who's going to be talking about supporting staff um, and with their mental health yeah, issues. Yeah. Um, so over to you, Amy. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me along this morning to talk. So my name is Amy Sayer. Um, I am the author of the book, which is called Supporting Staff Mental Health in Your School. Um, and I wanted to talk this morning about um, how we can kind of think about the impact of the pandemic on staff mental health in schools um, and how we can think about how we can have an impact on supporting staff uh, to make sure that their mental health and well-being is as good as it can be within educational settings. So I'm just going to um, ask Richard to load up my presentation. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I guess the theme of uh, the, the talks this morning is about impact. So I wanted just to start off with thinking about how has the uh, pandemic actually impacted staff mental health? Um, and there is an annual survey done by uh, one of the teaching unions about staff well-being. Um, and it's really, really useful, I think, as a, a way to kind of measure things on a national level, because obviously anecdotally, we know how um, staff mental how staff mental health has been affected by by the pandemic, but actually it's quite useful to see kind of what's going on nationally. So, in terms of what's going on, ninety one percent of teachers that uh, answered the survey reported that their job has adversely affected their mental health over the last twelve months. Um, Eighty seven percent have experienced an increase in anxiousness, and sixty six percent of uh, staff say that they, their schools and colleges um, don't have measures in place to monitor staff mental health. So it might be that they're, they're not having conversations about it. They aren't, they aren't doing kind of uh, well-being surveys. Um, and that's really not good enough in terms of how we can support staff. And then finally, 63% of staff say that their school doesn't have a safe and comfortable private space to take some time out and debrief um, outside of their classroom. So, you know, if something is going on for them um, and they are struggling with their mental health because of something specific that's happened within the classroom setting, not having that safe space has meant that potentially they're not having conversations about the support they might need. So this morning, I just wanted to talk to you about five ways that schools can have a positive impact on staff mental health. Um, and these are all things that need to be part of a, a kind of whole school approach. So they won't work in isolation. They need to be things that are working alongside each other. So first of all, it's really, really important that line managers are trained to have uh, to know how to have conversations about mental health with the people that they are responsible for. And I think, you know, unless there has been specific training being given, you, you could end up with, um, you know, quite a big uh, disparity between different faculty areas of the school or different year groups where some man line managers will be good at mental health conversations quite naturally because it's part of who they are. Um, but for people that might struggle with mental health conversations, it will then mean that the people that they're responsible for supporting won't necessarily have the opportunity to talk about how they're feeling and ask for support. So, you know, those conversations can be really awkward and uncomfortable. But what's really important is that line managers kind of understand what, what to say, um, how to have those conversations so that they're as comfortable as they can be, um, allowing people to open up and talk about how they're feeling. So the training needs to be put in place so there's a consistent level of support across all staff in the school. Um, and, you know, that that includes support staff um, and, you know, senior leaders themselves need to be able to have someone that they can go to to talk about their mental health. So there needs to be kind of sufficient training to make sure that um, everyone knows how to have conversations about mental health. Second of all, um, it's about having a really clear staff mental health policy in place. And again, this kind of helps to eliminate any inconsistencies that might be going on with some staff that get a fantastic amount of support because their line manager is aware of what they can offer um, and is able to have those conversations. And having a policy just makes things really, really clear and transparent for everyone so that, you know, if people are struggling with their mental health, that they're not going to feel as ashamed of, you know, trying to find a little uh, a little policy that's hidden somewhere or ask having to ask someone for their, you know, what they're entitled to. 
because there's, if there's a clear policy that outlines, you know, what are the reasonable adjustments that staff can be offered if they're struggling with their mental health? Um, what are the kind of external support agencies they can go to? Um, what support is there in school kind of in the first instance if they're struggling? So I think it's really important there is a policy because it will ensure consistency across all staff members. It will mean that people aren't feeling kind of ashamed or worried about what to ask for because it's quite clearly labelled out as something uh, that they're entitled to. Thirdly, um, it's really important that you have uh, a capacity to signpost staff to external support services that might be able to help them. Because in the first instance, it might not be that staff want to talk to someone in school about their mental health, but they still need to kind of open up that dialogue. So things like, you know, education support as a as a charity that supports educators, having some information about that external service, you know, national mental health charities like Mind or the Mental Health Foundation, having that as a, uh, something that is signposted for staff is really important. So it might be that you have a website area that is specifically dedicated to that. It might be that you have a, a mental health and wellbeing newsletter where that is published. But it kind of needs to be accessible. So it might be that you're saying to staff that within kind of every faculty office, there is a, you know, a, a poster that talks about external support services, because I guess the worst case scenario is that someone's really struggling with their mental health. They don't feel that there's someone they can talk to in school about it. And they're not quite sure where to go that will be a safe and private place for them to talk about what they might need. So having that as a you know a flow chart, a poster, whatever it is in your organisation is really important because it will just take out that kind of anxiety about where to go to um, and who to ask for support with. So the fourth thing that's quite important is providing a safe space that staff can go to debrief and offload. And, and that can be really tricky in schools, you know, all of the safeguarding rules that we have in place about, you know, having doors open and, and glass panes on doors um, are obviously vitally important. But there also needs to be uh, somewhere that is a staff only private safe space so that if staff need to have a conversation about their mental health with a line manager, that might feel like a safe place to do it. You know, going into someone's office and having a conversation might not be right for a number of reasons. So having that kind of safe and independent space for staff to go um, to talk about their mental health is really, really important. And it might be that they just need to use that because something specific has happened in their lessons uh, that has affected their mental health. But it might be that they just need to have a safe space to just process things and have some quiet time because schools are so, so busy. So finally, the last thing is about creating a culture of staff wellbeing around all of these mental health kind of policies and provisions. Because, you know, there needs to be things like um, staff wellbeing events calendared from the start of the year so that staff can kind of opt into different things. It shouldn't just be a kind of tag on tick box exercise where, you know, you've offered a staff yoga session and that's it. It needs to be something regular and part of a whole school approach to staff mental health. So having uh, staff wellbeing opportunities on the calendar has lots of purposes. One, people can plan in whether they want to attend and whether how they're going to actually put that into their routine. Um, two, it will mean that people are comfortable talking about it openly, including you know leadership team members who also need to look after their well-being at the moment. Um, and it just gives people this idea that it's valued because, you know, we put meetings and things on our calendars all the time. But actually putting a staff wellbeing event into that calendar is really, really important. Um, so it might be that you're going to have a, a kind of wellbeing week in your school. Um, and, and at my last school, there was a really lovely system of kind of a buddy system for that well-being week where you'd have someone anonymously and you'd have to kind of give them um, something nice every day. You know, it could be a, a quote chocolate bar, something to, to bring them a little bit of joy in their day and, and to, to bring that sense of belonging to a community when actually I guess the pandemic had quite a divisive effect in many ways in terms of, you know, we physically weren't able to be with each other a lot um, and we had to work in different ways. So it's about creating that sense of belonging and community through your uh, staff wellbeing policies. OK, so that, those are the five ways that schools can have a positive impact on staff mental health. So I think we're going to go to the questions and answers section now.
Morning, um, Amy. It's great to see you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, it's a bit of playback there. It's great that you just broke it down into those five things that everyone can think about. I think that was that, that really does. There's lots of questions around how we create a culture of mental health and well-being, but I think you've made it really, really super clear there. But there's a great question in the chat I want to go to first. What would you advise a member of staff who is advised to resign from their management post um, because they shared their mental health um, needs and it's and how and how school is negatively impacting them and, and that's the school's reaction will just step down perhaps you can't cope with the responsibility what what would your advice be to that that individual I think I think um that's a really really tricky situation and I think it's about making staff aware of what support they deserve so that they are not in that situation of you know someone saying well, just stand down because actually that isn't going to help their mental health at all you know if someone's struggling with their mental health and someone's taking away the thing that they absolutely love that then defeats the point so I think it's about making staff aware of what they're able to ask for and having that in a clear policy document will mean that hopefully that conversation shouldn't get to that point where there is this kind of ultimatum being given about well you know actually stand down from the responsibility it needs to be about you know investigating what is going on for that member of staff um are there kind of external things that they might support need support with um and, and giving them the chance to access support services um and kind of come up with a plan together because that that's the whole point that you know mental health isn't any different from physical health and you know you put provisions in place for staff that are struggling with the physical health condition so so it needs to be the same for mental health um and so, yes, that is a horrible situation. I guess I, I don't necessarily, the advice I would give obviously is that under the Equality Act, schools have a kind of legal responsibility mm -hmm. to look after people's mental health as well. And I almost don't want to say that because it should be like a moral obligation with schools that they should be looking after their members of staff. Uh, and it shouldn't get to that point of there having to be a kind of legal equality act to, pr to protect them, because you'd like to think that schools um, understand mental health enough to understand what to offer staff before they get to that point. Mm. Thank you, Amy. Because it's a great question from Jay Bonner and a tricky one. It's making me think about a parallel kind of um, theme around flexible working. And the research shows that actually quite often it's the line manager who's the middle manager who has said, no, we can't do flexible working. And the head doesn't even know. It hasn't even gone to governors. So my, my question to that scenario, Jay Bonner, is where are they in the hierarchy and has it been escalated? Because I think the head or the governors might be mortified to hear that that's actually advice being given to that individual um, as well. So just to really bottom line, Amy, like what sort of reasonable adjustments could somebody with a mental ill health diagnosis be offered? What what kind of modifications and considerations can we make to someone's contract or duties and responsibilities? Yeah, so in terms of responsibilities, um, when someone goes to their GP, there is a kind of paperwork thing that basically says that they can have a phased return to work or have modifications to their, their work hours um, for a temporary period. You know, these are reasonable adjustments, are short term changes that can be made to help people that are struggling with their mental health. Um, and so in that first instance, you know, if the GP is saying uh, that they can have kind of reduced uh, responsibilities, it will be for a short period of time and it will be um, with consent from that person rather than it being taken away. And so the reasonable adjustments could be that, you know, if they are uh, head of department, for example, for the, for like four weeks, um, they would then get support from their line manager to kind of redistribute a few of those responsibilities again you know, through discussion with them, because people that are struggling with their mental health will, will want to still do things and want to be part of a school community. And it might just be that one thing is the tipping point that is kind of affecting how they're feeling generally. And so going through, you know, the, the week with that member of staff that is, is struggling is really useful because it could be a pinch point. It could be the heads of department meeting just feels too much at that point in time. And actually, it would be OK for them to not be in those meetings for two or three weeks so that they can use that time mm. to work out how to recover and how to get the right support. Mm. So, you know, things like um, yeah, redistributing responsibilities is a completely reasonable adjustment over a short period of time. If they need to go to counselling appointments during the school day, that would be a reasonable adjustment because at the moment, the services are so stretched that people don't really have a choice about when they're getting appointments. They're just needing to take the first ones that are being offered. Um, and so it would be reasonable to allow a member of staff to, to have their counselling sessions during the school day. Um, and also things like if they're having medication, 
um, to, to help with their mental health, there might be some side effects to that medication. So again, you know, it might be that they need slightly reduced hours for a week or two just while those side effects are, are taking shape. So it really is about talking to the person, asking what they think they might need, and then being aware of having a policy for reasonable adjustments across the whole school. Brilliant, Amy. Thank you so much. You're so knowledgeable about this topic. I just want to do a shout out to Amy's now working independently. She has got a wealth of experience and expertise. Please do follow her on Twitter. Reach out to her if you want some training in your school to help you really think about that whole school culture of mental health and well-being in a really strategic and proactive way. So enjoy your Saturday. Thank you so much, Amy.